Okay. All right. Hey, good morning, TCC. My name is Pastor Steve, and this is Ty. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Due to this time of social distancing, uh, we've been having a lot of our meetings on Zoom, so we thought we'd bring you this morning's announcements in the same way. That's right, and we're so excited that you've joined us for our online worship experience this morning. Just a few moments, we're going to turn it over to the worship band, and they're going to lead us in a few songs. And we know that this has been a very weird season of being apart, and we so miss being with you guys. We can't wait to be back with you. But in, a, in the meantime, please pay attention to our Facebook and our Instagram page for activities and updates that you can do with your family during this season. Yeah. And also uh, keep your eye on your uh, email inbox uh, for our prayer email sent on Tuesdays and our weekly email with the latest news sent on Thursdays. That's right. And today we're going to have a special announcement at the end of our service. You're going to make sure that you stick around for that. Now, at this point in time, we're going to throw it over to our worship team now as they lead us in a time of singing and worshiping the Lord together. So wherever you're watching from, whatever you're doing, we invite you guys to join us together in worship. Would you take it away, team?
Welcome, thanks for tuning in, thanks for joining us. I know that this is an adjustment and we're still trying to figure it out, but I think it's really important for the people of God in the midst of chaos and uncertainty to purposefully engage with the spiritual disciplines, with the habits of grace. We need to be faithful in prayer, steadfast in our commitment to not cease meeting together, even if it looks a little different, and engaging in worship, even if it's awkward, and being devoted to the Word of God. I hope that you are in the Word, and in particular, that you are following along with us in our reading plan as we work our way through the Gospel of Mark. These are eternal truths. These are words for every circumstance and season of life. And in this Gospel, Mark shows us Jesus, and he invites us to answer the question, who is this man? Is he a failed prophet? Is he demon-possessed? Is he a blasphemer? Or is he the Christ? Is he the Messiah? Is he the anointed? Is he the answer to the problem that all of creation has been groaning for? So I want to take a moment here, and there will be a place to pause, and I want us, wherever you're meeting, collectively or individually, I want to pause for a moment and to pray, to acknowledge who he is, to lay it all before him, and to pray that God's Spirit would stir within us and that he would bless our time. So today, we are in chapter 12 of the book of Mark. But before we dive into that, I want us to back up a bit to remind ourselves of what's been going on and where we've been. So Jesus has come into Jerusalem. Mark is slowing down his narrative now. Tension is building. So we saw the triumphal entry, people waving branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now next week is actually Palm Sunday, so we'll be talking about that more and looking at that in relation to where we'll be in our reading plan, which is Mark 13, where Jesus is talking about his second coming, another triumphal entry that is yet to come. But for today, this is noteworthy because as Jesus is entering Jerusalem, the people are shouting and quoting from Psalm 118. And that's going to come up again in our passage. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem with a lot of fanfare, and then he clears the temple. He starts knocking over tables and chasing out money changers. And then the priests and the teachers of the law ask him, by what authority are you doing this? And Jesus says, I'll tell you, but first you got to answer my question. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? They discuss it. They say, if we say it was from heaven, he'll say, well, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from man, uh, that's not going to go over well with the crowd. So they said, we don't know. And Jesus says, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. And then Jesus tells them a story. And that's where we pick up in chapter 12 with a story. It's a story about John the Baptist. It's a story about the priests and the teachers of the law. And it's a story about Jesus. Here's what it says. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir, come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. 
Now, many of us are very much aware of the allegorical nature of this parable, where God the Father is the vineyard owner, Jesus is the Son, and all the servants are all the prophets that God sent. And Mark tells us that these religious leaders saw themselves in the parable. They knew that Jesus was calling them the tenants in the story. He's saying, you reject John the Baptist as a prophet. Of course you do. You rejected all the prophets sent to you. You and your forefathers rejected all the prophets, beat them, stoned them, killed them, and now you're rejecting the son himself. Even now you're planning on killing him. And then he says these words, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting from Psalm 118, just a few verses up in the same passage that the crowds were shouting about Jesus as he was entering Jerusalem. Jesus is making a statement here. The crowd is right about him, and they're wrong. They are rejecting the stone that becomes the capstone, the cornerstone, the living stone, as Peter will call him. He is who the prophets prophesied about. He is the Messiah. He shows us who he is by asking a question in Mark verse 35. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, Why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. Last week, we saw blind Bartimaeus crying out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Louder and again and again, Son of David, have mercy on me. Because yes, Jesus is the son of David. He comes from the line of David, but he is also David's Lord because he is God incarnate. He is the answer to the riddle. He is the Messiah, but a Messiah that they don't quite understand, a Messiah that the religious leaders reject. Well, as you can imagine, none of this goes over very well. The elders and teachers of the law don't like being called duplicitous murderers, so they're going to show him by being duplicitous murderers. They try to trap Jesus. They come at him with guns blazing. They start asking him questions, trying to make him look foolish with questions about marriage. And worse, they're trying to get him in trouble. And Jesus just masterfully dispenses with him. He says, oh, you are badly mistaken. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. You know how maddening that would be for them coming from a carpenter from Nazareth? It's a brutal takedown. Historians have actually recreated the scene, and here's a clip of it. Check it out. Yeah, that's pretty much what's going on here. They're throwing everything they can at him, and he's just knocking it away like nothing. Here's the best one they got. This is their silver bullet. They say, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this is a head tax or a poll tax, and it's very unpopular. Judas of Galilee actually led a revolt because of this tax. And to make matters worse, the coinage used here is blasphemous and idolatrous. It proclaims that Tiberius is divine, or at least semi-divine, and that he is the son of the divine Augustus. So if Jesus says, yes, it's okay, he's a traitor to God in Israel. If he says, no, he's a traitor to Caesar, and that's sedition. It's the perfect trap, except Jesus knows Kung Fu. You know, he, he starts off immediately by undermining them. Oh, oh, you know those blasphemous, idolatrous coins? Do you have any? Yeah, okay, well, can I see it? And then he says, uh, wh whose name is on this? Whose inscription? Caesar's. Okay, well, then it's his. So give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and what is God's to God. It's a brilliant answer, and, and there's many takeaways from it. Even right now, we are applying a principle here. We are actively living in obedience to government authority. We're not meeting together because we are submitting to the authority of our leaders. We are trying to be good citizens while also recognizing that we belong to a heavenly kingdom. We're still going to live that out. 
We're going to give to God what is God's. We're finding ways to gather and to give and to serve and to worship while giving to Caesar what is due. And there's plenty more we could say about that and plenty of ways that this could be applied and understood. But, but I don't want to get too wrapped up in it. You know, sometimes I, I think we can take the parables and sayings of Jesus and dissect it in a thousand different ways and pour over it and analyze every minute detail that we can actually miss the bigger picture. Yes, Jesus is saying something about submission to government and holiness, and yes, he's saying something about marriage and the afterlife in our text. But big picture here, Jesus is going to the cross. He's going to humiliation and torture and brutality and death. And Mark wants to make it clear. That doesn't happen because Jesus got tricked. He wasn't fooled. He wasn't undone by the scheming or cunning or cleverness of man. No, he predicts his death repeatedly. These traps, these tricks, he can easily knock them away. No one takes his life. He lays it down. He comes as a suffering servant out of love, perfectly manifesting obedience to the first and second greatest commandments, which is where our text takes us. Verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now notice that Mark is not some polemic. This is not just some propaganda against the religious leaders. Here we have one of the teachers of the law who is impressed with Jesus, who asks him a sincere question and commends Jesus on his answer. And Jesus praises this man, saying, You speak wisely when the teacher agrees that loving God with everything you have and loving your neighbor is more important than all offerings and sacrifices. Now Jesus, even in this chapter, warns people about the hypocrisy of the teachers of the law. But this one, at least, understands true religion, recognizes that all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commands. And Jesus tells him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. But being close is not the same as being in. He's still lacking. He's still needing something. It's not enough just to get the right answer. You, you can know these commands. That doesn't mean you obey them. You can know the good you ought to do. That doesn't mean you do it. So many people in our society think that they're good. They think they love their neighbors pretty well. They're nice, charitable, polite, until things get serious. And that's when you'll see videos of people fighting each other over toilet paper. The commands are good, but they can't save you. If, if they could, there, there's no reason for Jesus. They've had those commands for centuries. This teacher of the law is close, but he's not there yet. He needs faith in the person of Jesus. And so the last account that we have in our chapter is all about faith. This is what it says. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. 
That's not financially wise. It's a really bad investment. I mean, I mean, Jesus, like five seconds ago, when he first came into the temple, he condemns it. He says, this is a den of robbers. In the next chapter, uh, Jesus, speaking of the temple, says, not one stone is going to be left on another. It's all going to be thrown down. This is a bad investment. And the leaders, the people who are in charge of the temple, they're duplicitous murderers. It's outrageous in a way. It's like a woman who's living on food stamps empties her bank account to contribute to a new plane for some prosperity preacher. That's just foolish. But Jesus sees her heart. He sees that her action is motivated by faith, and not a faith in institutions, not a faith in the temple, not a faith in the priesthood. That would be foolishness to Jesus. No, he sees her faith in God. At the end of herself, she turns in faith to God. And that's how we all come to Christ. We have nothing to offer. We have nothing to give. We are destitute. We have only faith in Jesus of Nazareth. We can be so proud and arrogant and think we got it all handled and we can take care of ourselves. We can weather all the storms. I made smart investments. I got my 401k. I got my Roth IRA. I'm secure. And all it takes is a virus to bring an economy to its knees. And then things don't look so secure. We are people who think that we can obey the two greatest commandments when we can't even keep our hands out of our mouth. Our faith in ourselves is wildly misplaced. Or how about our institutions? Is that where your faith is? You know, our leaders may not be murderers, but they're doofuses most of the time, just like us. Even our religious leaders, even our churches, if your faith is in an institution, you're destined for disappointment. Because there's only one who is always faithful. There's only one who is always trustworthy. There's only one source for our security. There is only one answer to the problems of all the world. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. And that's who Mark is pointing us to. Jesus, the rejected stone that becomes the capstone, the son of David, the Messiah, the anointed, the answer to our problem. Let's pray. O Son of David, have mercy on us. Lord, increase our faith. Help us to believe in your words. Help us to recognize who you are in every circumstance and situation in life. Father, reveal yourself to us. Give us courage. Give us peace. Help us to carry out these commandments. Help us to live them out, Lord, by your Spirit, by the transforming work of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, be with this body. Help us to grow in our love and our admiration and our dedication to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, you made it. And as promised, we have a special update from John Moons and our search team on our search process. Go ahead and check that out. Hey, TCC. This is John Moons, a part of the pastoral search team. We are still going since January when we re-engaged in the search. I had a gentleman that we had been in talking with and actually talked quite, quite a bit with him and that didn't seem to work out. And so we are actually looking at some new names and we covet your prayers at this time. Just thought we'd give you the update. Uh, we're starting to engage in the Zoom interviews amongst each other. We're gonna start our first conference uh, this, this week. So uh, yeah, pray for us and uh, Keep, keep us encouraged. Bye. So thanks, John. Uh, we're going to continue to pray for the, our search team as they uh, continue the, the search for our next lead pastor and invite you to continue to pray for them as well. But just know things are going well. I'm super proud of our young staff and our team, and uh, we're, work, we're working at it hard. Yeah, and thank you for your support. Thanks for supporting the staff. It makes doing the job here at the church that much more easier, and we're proud to be a part of this family with you guys. We want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how you can give tithing, tithes and offerings to the Lord. 
Uh, there's a couple ways that you can do that. First and foremost, there's gonna be some information on the screen that you can get to if you wanna do that online. You can also find all of that information in your email in the weekly email that's sent out by clicking one of those links. It'll take you right there to set that up. You can also give traditionally by sending a check to the office here. And Pastor Steve will tell you a little bit more about how that has been going. Yeah, thanks so very much. We've been receiving your checks and uh, what a blessing as we continue to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And during these uncertain times, it's encouraging to us as well. Um, so again, thank you. And as we now uh, go into the rest of our day, just wanna bless you uh, in the name of the Lord with his peace. And, and now let's, let's uh, go to our team as they sing a blessing over us right from the book of Numbers. It's fair. 